The assignment that you've got um, this week is relatively straightforward because most of the work is done for you by the two textbooks that you've got. Now, now by that, I mean that um, Jobs and Moon Carson have actually laid out the problem right there before you uh, in assessing the similarities and differences between the material in Second Peter and in Jude. Um, the idea, what you must really do is to look at Second Peter chapter two in particular, and then compare it with the material that's in Jude that's very similar and that's different. And the way to do it um, is, is to do it like this. First of all, of course, read the material in the two textbooks and in Wikipedia. And then you see the layout that the um, authors have got in the two textbooks in showing side by side columns in terms of the similarities and the omissions. Um, I would read that, but uh, I would suggest you it's much more exciting and beneficial to you if you do your own research first, um, because you won't get the actual thrust and the excitement of what you're doing. Really, uh, I'm asking you to do what scholars do when they do what's called redaction study. Uh, a redaction study is to look at the way that an author crafts uh, in the New Testament his own uh, um, um, authorial intention in the use of the sources. And the use of those sources determines how you will ascertain and work out what that author is trying to say. So that, for example, if an author uses an Old Testament source, but alters the Old Testament source from the Greek translation, the Septuagint, or from a, a Hebrew text, and then alters it in such a way that then uh, appeals to what he is saying elsewhere, you can see then that his intention is to say something that is um, um, uh, commensurate with what the rest of his material is being shaped into to establish his main point. And that's true here. It's true in Peter and it's true in Jude. Uh, and so what you've got to do, first of all, is the really obvious thing, which would be to read through Second Peter and Jude at least two times and get a feel of it of the material. And then what I suggest you do is to um, uh, print out from a monitor uh, an enlarged uh, uh, paper of um, Second Peter chapter 2 and Jude, the chapter there. So that way you can mark up on a sheet of paper and you have both of them side by side. And then you can highlight the phrases uh, ideally, if you were doing this in a, a scholarly manner, you'd do it from the Greek text, but you, you don't have to do that. You could do it from the NIV, that's the, the, te the translation we're working in. So then, now you've, you do, you've got that. So now what you do is you go through the material in the text itself and you highlight the material that is basically the same and you highlight it uh, perhaps in, in yellow. So you've got really two sheets next to you, Second Peter 2 and uh, First uh, and Jude, and then you bring out and highlight the material that is exactly the same. Look at the order of the material too. So now you're looking at the similarities. And then after that, maybe you use a black pen or a different uh, colored highlighter. You look at the material that's different. And at the same time, when you've done that, you've got an idea now of the differences and of the similarities. And while you're looking at the similarities too, you're also looking at in what way are the similarities different either by what's said in between the similarities of each uh, account and the way that the similarities are used that might be different from the other source. And then when you've done that, 
now what you've got is um, uh, has to be looked at from an overarching standpoint because you now need to uh, ascertain what the author is trying to say in using these accounts because uh, it's very difficult and I'm not going to touch on this the material by uh, Jobs uh, and Karsten Mu really shows that it's very difficult to work out uh, who used uh, who did uh, Jude use uh, the material in Second Peter's copy, or was it the other way around? Or did both use the source and adapted the source for their own um, means? We can't use uh, modern day notions of either plagiarism or source analysis to think that uh, someone like uh, uh, Peter, who was an apostle, would actually uh, not use something written by uh, uh, someone who is not an apostle but a leader in the Jerusalem church or vice versa we have to accept the material that we have before us and we can speculate and build a theory upon which source became first but at this point in our study which is basically a, a, a very elementary study we don't really need to do that we just need to be aware of the different views and the scholars would have told us and said to us that if there was some uh, really strong uh, use of one source over another in terms of primacy, they would have told us that and, and we would have seen the advantage of what that would have done to help us to interpret the text. Uh, what we've got to do, and this is where I think it is exciting because you're doing your own research here, you're not relying upon a scholar at this point, what you do now is you've got to find out, and, and it's it's certainly easy to do in Jude, and and not that difficult to do in Second Peter, with the proviso that you take in the three chapters of Second Peter, you read them through again, the three chapters of Second Peter and Jude, and now you try and work out if you could put it in in one or two sentences, what is the author saying his main point what's his main point what's the overriding thing he's saying here what is it that determines all the other details in the book and uh, it, from that standpoint i'll tell you this that the both of them have different um, uh, um, points that they want to make a point that they want to make let's put it that way i'll, I'll simplify it they will have two points that have different uh, trajectories, not uh, wholly incompatible whatsoever, but certainly uh, selectively different, as you would expect from different people. They're not exactly the same. We're not looking at this from a what I'd call a canonical perspective of basically seeing how the, they harmonize within the canon of Scripture. We're looking at them in an individual way to see what is the author of Second Peter, who's writing uh, presumably in a Palestinian context, and the author of Jude, who's writing perhaps in a, a more widespread uh, context in uh, uh, a Palestinian, uh, Palestine and uh, Asia Minor, writing in terms of what he wants to say, because that's very important. Because that what that will do is once you work that out in terms of the singular perspective. You can now interpret the similarities and the differences that each of the scholar, each of the authors, are saying, uh, because that will give you the sort of linchpin or the hinge from which to interpret the material in the second chapter of Peter and in Jude, and then you will be able to then uh, compare both in the in the gist of your the substance of your paper. And then you can, to in your conclusion or in your main part, you can show then what these similarities and differences mean. Um, for example, um, pulling out in Jude the the Enoch passage in terms of the dispute over Michael's bo uh, over Moses' body with Michael and so forth. That's not found in Second Peter. 
um, I had, uh, why that's put there. Not, not. We're not talking about the, the canon of scripture of why, whether that's an authentic story that was pulled in by Jude. We're talking about its use in Jude that's not found in Second Peter. And then you look at the material before it and see how that is used by Peter in the way that he follows material without the material in Enoch and then compare that to his overall perspective and you put it all together and you should be able to come up with a way of not just explaining the similarities and differences but a, a, a feel of the the tenor of both of the perspectives in a general way and I think that's really really exciting and then what I do, this is, is what you do then, is to go to Job's and to uh, Moo and Carson and see what they say. That's the really exciting part now. And then see whether what they say matches with what you've come up with. Because now you're doing really scholarly work because you're, you you're actually interacting with the scholars. Because you may have missed something out that... Um, they, they considered, and that may cause you to say, oh, I better, I better argue against that. Or they may have come up with something that you see that you'd come up with too, and you could put that in to say, to show that they are supporting your work. So you're doing two things there. What you're doing is you're using their ideas to show that it buttresses your thought. And then you're also answering their idea, uh, their objections to what you you think is the case. Now, I'm actually taking you a little bit more beyond an introductory essay here. I'm showing you um, what more advanced study is about, because in, in some ways it's easy to write a, a comparison of ideas, but the key to it is, and I've said this before, is to interact with scholars who hold views that you don't necessarily hold of what you've come to because they disagree with themselves as well. And you've got to come up with, if, if you've got a view that you see that is quite strong and one of the scholars disagree with you, what you've got to do is you've got to scratch your head and say, now, how can I establish my standpoint when this scholar disagrees with me? Then you've got to think and then put an argument in there to show why the scholar is wrong. You, you've got the right to be able to do that. That's your essay. If you ignore it, then I notice that. I, when, I, when I read lots of papers of students who ignore what, what uh, any views that are against the view that they are writing, which basically says it's a lack of creative thinking, because you have to be thinking on your feet. Now, the easiest way to do this essay and I have to confess, in, in many, many years ago, when I was in your position, and I've come across this many, many times myself with marking papers, is students don't do all this that I'm suggesting to you, which is um, what I'd call original research, is what they do is they'd look at Job's material, they'd look at uh, material in Moo and Carson, and then they just use that material to interpret the text which is what you're doing there is you're reading the text and the material and the problem, the essay problem, through the lens of the three scholars. And that's a sort of a cheap way of doing the paper. Um, now, you can do it that way and then try and get your own perspective by studying the material, but you've been colored by what the authors have said because you're reading it through what they're saying. The better way is to do your own research and approach it fresh after reading their material, but approach it fresh and then look at their material and see how it, your, your conclusions stack up against what they um, uh, are saying, recognizing, of course, that they've studied this material for, for many, many years. So they're going to obviously have points of view that will either differ with you and you can compliment yourself. You see that you've actually worked along to the point where what you say is in agreement with them, but you may have come up with one or two points that uh, 
uh, they may have missed. You've got to have confidence in yourself in what you're doing at this point. And I think that that's really exciting. So it's, it's an essay that uh, has uh, possibilities for you uh, uh, to give you a challenge to actually do some what I'd call original research in a, a, a subject that is somewhat baffling that uh, two leading authors in the Christian church in these early stages have used the source or copied a source from each other.